the friends today i'm again back to share a story with you from the timeless collection of rabindranath tagore today we will listen to once there was a king so let's begin with the story once upon a time there was a king when we were children there was no need to know who the king in the fairy story was it didn't matter whether he was called shiladitya or shaliban whether he lived at kashi or kannauj the thing that made a 7 year old boy's heart go thump thump with delight was this one sovereign truth this reality of all realities once there was a king but the readers of this modern age are far from more exact and extracting when they hear such an opening to a story they are at once critical and suspicious they apply the search light of science to its legendary haze and ask which king the story tellers have become more precise in their turn they are no longer content with the old indefinite there was a king but assume instead of looking for a profound learning and begin once there was a king named ajat shatru the modern reader's curiosity however is not so easily satisfied he blinks at the author through his scientific spectacles and ask again which ajat shatru every school boy knows the author proceeds that there were three ajat shatrus the first were born in the 20th century bc and other died at the tender age of 2 years and 8 months i deeply regret that it is impossible to find from any trustworthy source a detailed account of his reign the second ajat shatru is better known as historians if you refer to the new encyclopedia of history by this time the modern readers suspicions are dissolved he feels he may safely trust his author he says to himself now we shall have a story that is both improving and instructive ah how we all love to be deluded we have a secret dread of being thought ignorant and we end by being ignorant after all only we have done it in a long and roundabout way there is an english proverb ask me no questions and i will tell you no lies the boy of 7 who is listening to a fairy story understands that perfectly well he withhold his question while the story is being told so the pure and beautiful falsehood of it all remains naked and innocent as a babe transparent as truth itself limpid as a fresh bubbling spring but the ponderous and learned lie of a moderns has to keep its true character draped and veiled and if there is discovered anywhere the least little peep hole of deception the reader turns away with a prudish disgust and the author is discredited when we were young we understood all sweet things and we could detect the sweets of a fairy story by an unerring science of our own we never cared for such useless things as knowledge we only cared for the truth and our unsophisticated little hearts knew well where the crystal palace of truth lay and how to reach it but today we are expected to write pages of facts while the truth simply is there was a king i remember vividly that evening in calcutta when the fairy story began the rain and the storm had been incessant the whole of the city was flooded the water was knee deep in our lane i had a straining hope which was almost a certainty that my tutor would be prevented from coming that evening i sat on the stool in the far corner of the veranda looking down the lane with the heart beating faster and faster every minute i kept my eye on the rain and when it began to grow less i prayed with all my might oh god please send some more rain till half past 7 for i was quite ready to believe that there was no other need for rain except 
to protect one helpless boy one evening in one corner of Calcutta from the deadly clutches of his tutor. If not in answer to my prayer, at any rate, according to some grosser law of physical nature, the rain did not give up. But alas, not did my teacher. Exactly to the minute in the bend of the lane, I saw his approaching umbrella. The great bubble of hope burst in my breast and my heart collapsed. Truly, if there is a punishment to fit the crime after death, then my tutor will be born again as me and I shall be born as my tutor. As soon as I saw his umbrella, I ran as hard as I could to my mother's room. My mother and my grandmother were sitting opposite one another, playing cards by the light of a lamp. I ran into the room and flung myself on the bed beside my mother and said, Mother dear, the tutor has come and I have such a bad headache. Couldn't I have no lessons today? I hope no child of immature age will be allowed to read this story and I sincerely trust it will not be used in textbook or primers for schools. For what I did was dreadfully bad and I received no punishment. On the contrary, my wickedness was crowned with success. My mother said to me, All right. And turning to the servant added, Tell the tutor that he can go back home. It was perfectly plain that she didn't think my illness very serious. She went on with her game as before and took no further notice. And I also burying my head in the pillow, laughed to my heart's content. We perfectly understood one another, my mother and I. But everyone must know how hard it is for a boy of seven years old to keep up the illusion of illness for a long time. After about a minute, I got hold of my grandmother and said, Granny, do tell me a story. I had, I had to ask this many times. Granny and mother went on playing cards and took no notice. At last, mother said to me, Child, don't bother us. Wait till we finish our game. But I persisted. Granny, do tell me a story. I told mother she could finish her game tomorrow. But she must let granny tell me a story there and then. At last, my mother threw down the cards and said, You had better do what he wants. I can't manage him. Perhaps she had it in her mind that she would not have some tiresome tutor on the morrow, while I should be obliged to be back to those stupid lessons. As soon as mother had given away, I rushed to the granny. I got hold of her hand and, dancing with delight, dragged her inside my mosquito curtain onto the bed. I clutched hold of the bolster with both hands in my excitement and jumped up. When I had got a little quieter, Granny said, Now let's have the story. So Granny went on, and the king had a queen. That was good to begin with. He had only one. It is usual for kings in fairy stories to be extravagant in queens. And whenever we hear that there are two queens, our hearts begin to sink. One is sure to be unhappy. But in Granny's story, the danger was past. He had only one queen. We next hear that the king had not got any son. At the age of seven, I didn't think there was any need to bother if a man had no son. He might only have been in the way. Nor are we greatly excited when we hear that the king has gone away into the forest to practice austerities in order to get a son. There was only one thing that would have made me go into the forest and that was to get away from my tutor. But the king left behind with his queen a small girl who grew up into a beautiful princess. Twelve years pass away and the king goes on practicing austerities and never thinks all this while of his beautiful daughter. The princess has reached the full bloom of her youth. The age of marriage has passed but the king does not return and the queen pines away with grief and cries. Is my golden daughter destined to die unmarried? Oh me! 
what fate is mine then the queen sent men to the king to entreat him earnestly to come back for a single night take one meal in the palace and for this the king consented the queen cooked with the greatest care 64 dishes and made a seat for him of sandalwood and arranged the food in plates of gold and cups of silver the princess stood behind with the peacock tail fan in her hand the king after 12 years absence came into the house and the princess waved the fan lighting up all the room with her beauty the king looked in his daughter's face and forgot to take his food at last he asked his queen pray who is this girl whose beauty shines as a gold image of the goddess whose daughter is she the queen beat her forehead and cried oh how evil is my fate do you not know your daughter the king was struck with amazement he said at last my tiny daughter has grown to be a woman what else the queen said with a sigh do you not know that 12 years have passed by but why did you not give her in marriage asked the king you were away the queen said and how could i find her a suitable husband the king became vehement with excitement the first man i see tomorrow he said when i come out of the palace shall marry her the princess went on waving her fan of peacock feathers and the king finished his meal the next morning as the king came out of his palace he saw the son of a brahman gathering sticks in the forest outside the palace gate his age was about 7 or 8 the king said i will marry my daughter to him who can interfere with the king's command at once the boy was called and the marriage garlands were exchanged at this point i came up close to my wise granny and asked her eagerly what then in the bottom of my heart there was a devout wish to substitute myself for that fortunate wood gatherer of 7 years old the night was resonant with the patter of rain the earthen lamp by my bedside was learning low my grandmother's voice was droned as she told the story and all these things served to create in the corner of my credulous heart the belief that i had been gathering sticks in the dawn of some indefinite time in the kingdom of some unknown king and in a moment garlands had been exchanged between me and the princess beautiful as a goddess of grace she had a gold band in her hair and gold earrings in her ears she had a necklace and bracelet of gold and a golden waist chain around her waist if my grandmother were an author how many explanations she would have to offer for this little story first of all everyone would ask why the king remained 12 years in the forest secondly why should the king's daughter remain unmarried all that while this would be regarded as absurd even if she could have got so far without a quarrel still there would have been a great hue and cry about the marriage itself firstly it never happened secondly how could there be a marriage between a princess of the warrior caste and the boy of a priestly brahmin caste her readers would have imagined at once that the writer was preaching against our social customs in an underhand way and they would write letters to the papers so i pray with all my heart that my grandmother may be born a grandmother again and not through some cursed fate take birth as a luckless grandson so with a throb of joy and delight i asked granny what then granny went on then the princess took her little husband away in great distress and built a large palace with seven wings and began to cherish her husband with great care i jumped up and down in my bed and clutched at the bolster more tightly than ever and said what then granny continued the little boy went to school and learned many lessons from his teachers as he grew up his class fellow began to ask him who is that beautiful lady who lives with you in the palace with the seven wings the brahman son was eager to know who she was he could only remember how one day he had been gathering sticks and a great disturbance arose but all that was long ago that he had no clear recollection four or five years passed in this way his companions always asked him who is that beautiful lady in the palace with the seven wings 
and the brahman's son would come back from school and sadly tell the princess my school companions always ask me who is that beautiful lady in the palace with the seven wings and i can give them no reply tell me who you are the princess said let it pass today i will tell you some other day and every day the brahman son would ask who are you and the princess would reply let it pass today i will tell you some other day in this manner four or five more years passed away at last the brahman's son became very impatient and said if you do not tell me today who you are o beautiful lady i will leave this palace with seven wings then the princess said i will certainly tell you tomorrow the next day the brahman's son as soon as he came home from the school he said now tell me who are you the princess said tonight i will tell you after supper when you are in bed okay the brahman son said very well and he began to count the hours in expectation of the night and the princess on her side spread white flowers over the golden bed and lighted a golden lamp with fragrant oil and adorned her hair and, and dressed in a beautiful robe of blue and began to count the hours in expectation of the night that evening when her husband the brahman son had finished his meal too excited almost to eat and had gone to the golden bed in the bed chamber strewn with flowers he said to himself tonight i shall surely know who this beautiful lady is in the palace with the seven wings the princess took for her the food that was left over by her husband and slowly entered the bed chamber she had to answer that night the question who was the beautiful lady who lived in the palace with the seven wings and as she went up to the bed to tell him she found that a serpent had crept out of the flowers and had bitten the brahman's son her boy husband was lying on the bed of flowers with a pale face in death my heart suddenly ceased to throb and i asked with a choking voice what then granny said then but what is the use of going on any further with the story it would only lead to what was more and more impossible the boy of 7 did not know that if there was some what then after death no grandmother of a grandmother could tell us all about it but the child's faith never admits defeat and it would snatch the mantle of death itself to turn him back it would be outrageous for him to think that such a story of one teacherless evening could so suddenly come to a stop therefore the grandmother had to call back her story from the ever shut chamber of the great end but she did it so simply it is merely by floating the dead body on a banana stem on the river and having some incantations read by a magician but on that rainy night and in the dim light of a lamp death loses all its horror in the mind of the boy when the story ends the tired eyelids were weighed down with sleep thus it is that we send the little body of the child floating on the back of sleep over the still water of time and then in the morning read a few verses of incantation to restore him to the world of life and light so friends this is end of the story please stay tuned for the next story please do listen and do support thank you so much